going to hear from uh, Dr. Uh, Carl Dugramji on meeting the challenges of insomnia in your patient population, co-management strategies, standards of care, and emerging pharmacotherapeutic options. So this is obviously a domain that every single one of us uh, has to deal with clinically because it's just a universal challenge with mental disturbance uh, that sleep gets messed up. So Dr. Dugramji, it's all yours. Thank you. It's, it's really great to see all of you. Uh, who, how many people here are from Boston, the area? Well, as much as I hate to say this, it's great to be in Boston, but we're going to get that Super Bowl back next year. Just watch. So uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, we'll be speaking about insomnia today, and um, uh, I'm delighted that uh, all of you are wide awake and alert. This is a challenging time to be speaking about sleep, right? Because number one, you just had lunch. Number two, it's the usual postprandial, that's actually an afternoon dip in alertness that all of us have. So it's a tough challenge, but we're all up for it. We're gonna be excited. This is sleep. This is, we're gonna talk about how to wake up. Okay, my, this, these are my disclosures. Um, I'm not sure how much time I should spend on this slide, but I'm sure all of you know this. So any questions on this, please feel free to ask. Our objectives are to talk about the relationship between insomnia and other psychiatric disorders and talk about the bidirectionality as well as some causality aspects there and the challenges of co-treatment, number one. We're going to be speaking about current clinical guidelines in the management of chronic insomnia, recommended standards of care and limitations of available therapies. We're also going to be evaluating clinical evidence surrounding emerging insomnia pharmacotherapies, including safety efficacy, adverse events, and risk to benefit ratios. We'll be doing all of that in 45 minutes. 33% uh, of the US adult population experiences insomnia on a nightly basis. When you think about it, that's remarkable, isn't it? What that means is that a third of you here, roughly, have been having difficulty with sleep on a continuous basis throughout a number of the, the, the past few weeks and even the past few months. And that's an enormous number of individuals when you think about it. And when you look at the slide, um, even uh, about more than half the population has had insomnia at one point or another. So this is a common malady. And across the, uh, we see the same percentage across many countries, across many cultures. Insomnia is the second most common complaint known to man. The first most common, of course, is upper airway, congestion, upper sniffles, and that sort of thing. And the third most common is pain. Here's a, here's a case which kind of describes some of the points that I'd like to make in terms of the diagnosis of insomnia. This is a 71-year-old man complaining of unrefreshing sleep following retirement. The onset of the problem was about four months ago. The frequency of insomnia is about four to five nights per week, so it's a fairly common problem. He says that he, his mind spins when he goes to bed. Very common uh, experience with insomniacs. He said, my mind spins, it goes rapidly. Uh, he feels washed out during the day. He feels he has low energy. His mood is, 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 is problematic. He feels irritable. There are no medical contributors. His exam is normal, except for the mental status exam. It shows some psychomotor slowing. Although he says to you, my mood is fine. My mood is fine right now. His affect seems to be restricted. There are no other uh, com uh, uh, comorbidities or mental status issues. His cognitive functions are intact. Let's go to the next slide. I think I can do that. Here we go. Now, let's, let me ask you a question about this to gauge your fund of knowledge. This 71-year-old man, what additional criteria do we need to have this person meet diagnostic criteria for a DSM-5 insomnia disorder? Number one, the duration of the insomnia has to be more than six months. Remember, it was less than that. Number two, the difficulty with insomnia has to occur nightly. Remember, it was only four to five nights per week. Number three, we have to have laboratory confirmation of a sleep latency or a time to fall asleep of less or more than one hour. Number four, he must not meet criteria for major depressive disorder. Number five, it doesn't matter because he already meets criteria for major depressive disorder. All right, most of you got this right, but just by a margin. 38% of you got this correct. 36% of you said he must not meet criteria for major depressive disorder. Remember that. That's a good, I'm glad you guys made that mistake. Number one, duration of the insomnia has to be more than six months. Let's go to the next slide to show you why those answers are incorrect. Number one, we have to have the complaint, right? Dissatisfaction with sleep quantity or quality. I don't sleep long enough. I wake up a lot at night. I wake up feeling washed out. Those are all 
excellent initial complaints of insomnia, core complaints of insomnia. Number two, distress or impairment. Remember our gentleman here felt washed out throughout the course of the day. He was fatigued. There was a sense of not functioning correctly. There's daytime impairment. Number three, more than three nights per week. The frequency has to be more than three nights, and this man met those frequency criteria. Number four, more than three months in duration, not six months as some of you had said. Number E, adequate opportunity to sleep. Some people are sleep deprived. They just basically go to bed at two in the morning, wake up at three in the, or seven in the morning, and feel, feel tired. That is not insomnia. That's sleep deprivation. But interestingly, no, the, the criteria do not say that you have to exclude major depression or other psychiatric disorders. The criteria say that, that you can specify it if it occurs with these other disorders. We call these comorbidities. So interestingly, notice insomnia in this particular diagnostic rubric is being taken as a disorder in and of its own right. In and of its own, uh, uh, thank you so much. By, in, uh, that is, insomnia is taken as a disorder, a, med a condition in and of its own right, which can comorbidly exist with other conditions. So you can have depression and insomnia occurring at the same time. One of the challenges we have with insomnia, of course, we're, we're never quite sure what the causality, where the causality lies, that the insomnia. Uh, occur as a result of that depression, major depressive disorder, did the insomnia potentially cause the major depressive disorder, or is there no relationship with one another? And I think the DSM-5 allows us to at least diagnose insomnia with that ambiguity built into the diagnosis, uh, the diagnostic criteria. So insomnia disorder, disorder in and of its own right, can be comorbid with, existing with, other medical psychiatric conditions. What causes insomnia? And I think there are many, many uh, theoretical formulations about the etiology of insomnia. We still don't quite know, but one thing we do know, there's significant hyperarousal or hyperactivation along multiple axes, psychological, physiological, as well as biological in nature. So insomnia, we see the hyperarousal manifestations along the lines of body metabolic rate, much higher. Cognitive arousal, you see insomniacs sort of lying in bed feeling that their minds are sort of spinning around very rapidly. Uh, EEG hyperarousal, we can actually quantify this brain hyperarousal by the rapidity of the EEG waves, both during sleep and wakefulness, and during multiple stages of sleep. Heightened brain metabolism, brain metabolic rates are elevated in insomniacs. They're actually on hyperdrive, not only at, at night during sleep, but also during the course of the day. And also sympathetic activation is, is high. Hypothalamic pituitary axis on multiple planes is, 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 is heightened. So insomnia in many ways is a disorder of hyperarousal, hyperactivation, not just during wake, sleep, but also during wakefulness. You could actually say that insomnia is in fact not a sleep disorder. It's a 24-hour disorder that affects, the, that affects individuals throughout the course of the day. Now, what are, in, what are the impairments that insomnia might cause? And here's an area where we need to do much more research. But we know that insomniacs have a, so, have a higher rate of various morbidities, and, and, and both psychiatric as well as biological, uh, 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 medical in nature. They enjoy life and relationships less so. They have a decreased quality of life. Their absenteeism rates are higher on the job and also their job performance is lower. We know that they have a higher rate of motor vehicle accidents, higher risk of falls and accidents. Their healthcare costs increase as people develop insomnia. They have less concentration and memory. Insomniacs have a lower pain threshold. That is, they complain of pain, they feel pain more acutely. Interestingly, when we make them sleep, help them sleep better, their pain thresholds begin to become higher. That is, they feel pain less acutely. Hypertension and diabetes begin to develop with chronic insomnia. So individuals who do not yet have, insom who do not yet have uh, diabetes or hypertension who have insomnia for multiple years begin to develop hypertension and diabetes after multiple years of having insomnia. And finally, insomniacs die off more rapidly. They have a higher mortality rate. Now, are, is insomnia the cause of all of these impairments? Is it only comorbid with these impairments? Is it in some way uh, predictive of these impairments? We don't know, but we do think that there is something about insomnia that increases the vulnerability to all of these impairments. Insomnia exists in a comorbid fashion with multiple psychiatric disorders. Uh, alcohol abuse, uh, drug abuse, dysthymia, major depression, 
anxiety disorders. Interestingly, uh, most insomniacs do not have a psychiatric disorder, about 60% of them. So to be able to properly evaluate insomnia, we sort of have to be able to understand what other, what other conditions, medical conditions, may be associated with insomnia to be able to understand possibly underpinnings correctly. But, but let's, th let's take a look at some of the psychiatric comorbidities with insomnia. Actually, major depression is one of the ones that's been most studied. Major depression, uh, insomnia rather, is not only common complaint in depressives, about 80%, of depressives have a sleep-wake problem. But insomnia, interestingly, occurs prior to the emergence of depression in most cases. We think if a person has major depression and cannot sleep well, that aha, depression may have caused the, the insomnia. And in fact, it may well have. But interestingly, temporally speaking, insomnia comes before, in many cases, decades before, the development of a major depressive disorder, as opposed to after the development of the disorder, which is fascinating and I think raises the question, did that long-term insomnia in some way predict or, or, or in some way produce the vulnerability for an oncoming depressive disorder? Insomnia itself is associated with a higher rate of lifetime and recurrent major depression. So not only does it predict depression now, but its persistence after the resolution of a depressive disorder, predicts yet another depressive disorder later on down the line. In bipolar individuals, it predicts the occurrence of a manic episode. It predicts poor outcome in depressive disorders to therapy. And finally, its, on, its onset predicts mania and bipolar depression, as I mentioned a couple of seconds ago. So it's a, it's, it's a problem. It, really, it complicates the, 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 the course of depression and the treatment of depression as well. These are patients who have achieved remission with, uh, with treatment after fluoxetine who have had major depressive disorder. They've achieved remission from depression. You'll notice that one of the most... Uh, the highest persistent, the most common persistent symptom in these patients is sleep disturbance, and the second most common is fatigue. So despite resolution of depression and achievement of remission, these folks still cannot sleep well, and these are the folks, these are the very individuals who have a heightened risk for the occurrence of another depressive episode later on down the line. And the, and the question has always been, can you prevent the occurrence of another depressive episode by treating these folks w for their sleep disturbance. And I'm going to show you some data later on which strongly suggest that, that, holding, that, that doing so may be advantageous to the depressed patient. Now, as I mentioned before, insomnia, um, there are many other comorbid medical conditions that occur with insomnia. Uh, obstructive apnea, restless leg syndrome, gastroesophageal reflux, these are only examples, shift work problems, medications and so on. And of course, from a clinical standpoint, our job really is to be able to manage these comorbidities effectively when we're confronted with insomnia. We don't know whether insomnia contributed to these disorders, whether these disorders are causing the insomnia, but it makes good clinical sense. Go after the primary disorder, the main disorder, and then worry about the insomnia later. Now, I'm about, I'm, what I'm about, I'm going to challenge what I just said to you in the next few minutes by, by, by suggesting that it may actually be a better idea in some cases to treat the insomnia with the comorbidity right, right at, from the get-go. But be that as it may, the point here being that go after the disorder that comorbidly exists with insomnia aggressively. And if insomnia persists, then you may want to treat it directly. Uh, let, let's, let's go on to this sort of um, uh, algorithm that I'm just kind of suggesting. Is insomnia comorbid with another medical or psychiatric condition? Yes, if it is. Well, then treat the comorbidity first. And if insomnia persists, then go after the insomnia itself directly. Uh, if, if insomnia occurs in isolation, I think in this, in this audience that may not be something you see very commonly. Mental health professionals don't see insomnia by itself, primary insomnia, that much. We tend to see it with, with, with comorbid psychiatric phenomena, uh, 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 conditions. Nevertheless, in the primary care setting, this is common. But treating insomnia directly is not a bad idea. Of course, it's a good idea in that case. Interesting, we have some people who are just simply short sleepers. They complain of insomnia 
but they have no daytime uh, impairments whatsoever. I saw a woman not too long ago, she came to me hysteric, very concerned that she may have had a horrible sleep problem, and she, you know, she, she really only needed four or five hours of sleep per night, and I, I asked her if she was impaired during the course of the day. She said, no, I feel fine. Do you fall asleep during lectures? No, I mean, are you fatigued? Not at all. Four hours of sleep is all I need. And I'm thinking, boy, that's awesome, isn't it? Uh, and, and, and she was a short sleeper. She had a genetic, ten her family, uh, uh, her mom and dad, uh, actually on her dad's side, I think it was, all were short sleepers. So there, are, there is this population that just simply needs less sleep. So this is a nice algorithm to use for, for, for us uh, in, in terms of managing insomnia. How do we manage insomnia? Well, there are many different strategies, cognitive behavioral therapies, uh, many of us, uh, many, pa many of our patients have already used nutraceuticals, uh, uh, over-the-counter substances, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the prescription pharmacologic agents as well. Just in terms of CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, very important treatment for insomnia. There are multiple different types of CBT, um, categories of CBT, which put together uh, are referred to as cognitive behavioral therapy. Stimulus control involves uh, the actually telling patients if they cannot sleep for longer than maybe half an hour or so to get up out of bed, do something differently, and then come back to bed only when they feel sleepy. And the, and, and the rationale here is to cut that association between being in bed and not sleeping, you know, that uh, psychological association that builds up once somebody spends too much time in bed in a sleepless fashion. Biofeedback, relaxation training, I'm sure all of you know how to do this. It's quite effective as well. The ones that are in red are the ones that have the greatest amount of data backing them up. Uh, backing the therapies up. I've had also using sometimes paradoxical intention, uh, i.e. telling patients that they should not sleep at all. I said this to a patient, I said, I'd like you to go home and try to not sleep for the next week at all. And uh, interestingly, it, works very, it worked very nicely. Some patients who are, I guess, gullible uh, or, or, or easily suggestible uh, have, have a positive response to this. Now, going to some of the... Um, um, uh, uh, data behind this. CBT has been shown to work in numerous, numerous different studies. These are 20 research controlled studies of more than 1,000 patients. And you can see that the post treatment, that the post treatment time period, sleep onset latency, that is the time that it takes people, patients to fall asleep, had improved by 20 minutes. Wake after sleep onset, that is the amount of wakefulness once these patients have fallen asleep, was reduced by 26 minutes. Now you may say, well, those are not great, you know, great numbers. I mean, only, only 20 minutes of better sleep is not, doesn't sound all that great. Believe it or not, that's the best that any pharmaceutical compound can do, about 20 or 25 minutes improvement in terms of the time that it takes to fall asleep as well as the amount of wakefulness after fall, falling asleep. So these are very nice numbers, and what's also important about CBT is that these changes are lasting. They last after the completion of therapy, up to a year, the data have shown. So CBT is a fantastic way of producing change, lasting change in insomniacs. In terms of the sleep hygiene things that I mentioned a little bit earlier, we all know these. Sleep hygiene education is not in and of itself sufficient to treat insomnia, but it's necessary. If patients are violating sleep hygiene rules, the other treatments don't work well. But, but by itself, sleep hygiene has not been shown to work uh, predictably well. But things like getting up out of bed at the same time, I think of all the sleep hygiene recommendations, this is probably the most important. Reset, reset your circadian pacer in such a way that you have a 24-hour rhythm and not a longer rhythm. And the best way to do that is to get up out of bed at the same time. The time that you go to bed is irrelevant. It's really the time that you wake up out of bed that's the most critical uh, in terms of resetting circadian rhythms. And of course, light exposure at that time as well. Uh, you know, worrying and, and activation is so common in insomniacs that sometimes setting a time when they can worry as much as possible, but that time not being bedtime is sometimes helpful. I tell patients, you know, to set aside maybe an hour, or maybe half an hour after dinner, before dinner, but not at bedtime, to do as much worrying as they possibly can. Um, the, other, the, other in, the other positive things that could be helpful are eliminating caffeine and nicotine, other stimulants. Caffeine elimination after lunchtime could be helpful 
uh, in some people. Also, of course, not napping as much as possible, not, not, not being watchful of those time cues, such as the watch or the clock, setting aside those cues may be helpful. One of the things we try to also emphasize to insomniacs is to avoid bright light exposure, especially close to bedtime. Many of the electronic devices we use, such as um, you know, television, certainly smartphones, uh, uh, iPads, and so on that you have in front of you, even though the light is not that bright, tend to have a high degree of blue light, blue, blue light spectrum. And that blue light may, re, may, may, uh, may delay the onset of melatonin at nighttime. So blocking blue light may be helpful. And I, I like to use these blue light filter glasses. They're available commercially. And I tell insomniacs to wear these for two or three hours before bedtime, regardless of what they're doing. Uh, some people you know, reset their iPhones to the night shift mode, but that in and of itself may not be sufficient. So blocking light as much as possible, especially blue light in the evening, and bright light exposure in the morning could be very, very helpful. All right, let's go to our next ARS. Factors favoring the initial utilization of CBT over pharmacotherapy in insomnia management include which of the following? That is, we can go for CBT, or we can go with sleeping pills. Uh, with an insomniac. If you had uh, the opportunity to do, to do both equally, which would you do first in your insomniac, CBT or pharmacotherapy? Uh, factors favoring initial CBT over pharmacotherapy include which of the following? Number one, need for more rapid clinical improvement. Number two, no comorbid medical conditions. Number three, history of substance use or present substance use. And number four, time limitation. Please vote. Excellent. Most of us got this correct. Number two, no comorbid medical conditions. Actually, it's quite the opposite. The presence of comorbid medical conditions predicts a better response, a, a better course of treatment with, with, uh, uh, with, with, um, uh, with, um, uh, with pharmacotherapy. Let's go to the, uh, the uh, with, with CBT, excuse me. Let's go to the next slide. And here's a, here's a table which may guide us. Starting with pharmacotherapy is optimal. If there's a lack of a, a specific cognitive uh, or, or, or sleep hygiene violation or specific behavioral factor which may, which may predict positive response to CBT, uh, also, if there's, a, if, there's, if there's a need for rapid improvement, I've had this happen in, in some insomniacs who are so fatigued, so pro, it's so problematic for them, they have to get back to work, they have to do something, but they simply cannot. Pharmacotherapy is, is usually faster. There are time limitations, we just, the patient cannot come in for treatment often or on a regular basis. Finances, unfortunately, tend to, tend to favor pharmacotherapy. Uh, starting with CBT is, is, is optimal when there's a need for sustained clinical improvement, history of substance abuse, and if there are multiple, multiple medical comorbidities with pharmacology may, may, may complicate the picture. And of course, in hypnotic discontinuation, studies have shown that patients who have, chronic, who have used hypnotics on a chronic basis have a much easier time discontinuing hypnotics and sleeping pills and benzos in general if we start CBT specifically targeted for insomnia. Now, in terms of the substances, in, uh, insomniacs out there, of course, use all sorts of things. One of the most favorite things for insomniacs are these dietary supplements defined by the NIH uh, Dietary Supplement Health Act as, the, uh, uh, as foods uh, that really supplement existing food, that is, they're taken together with or on top of uh, the foods that nor patients typically take, but that also contain vitamins, minerals, herbs, amino acids, or some other things, and are taken orally. So that's kind of the definition of a um, of, of, of dietary supplement. And there are many, many of these. In the next three slides, I've divided them into three categories, things that have some evidence backing them up, Number two, things that have almost no evidence backing them up. And number three, things that are probably dangerous for you that you should not take. In the first slide, the, we see the two, two, the, two most, the, the two best studied, either dietary supplements or just simple over-the-counter agents. Number one, valerian root, used quite commonly, especially in Europe. Uh, it seems to work. There's some studies suggesting it works. The issue with valerian, of course, is that the, effect of, the efficacy tends to be variable and unpredictable and may have some side effects such as uh, gastrointestinal upset and headache. The first generation H1 blockers, such as difen difenhydramine, is not a dietary supplement, obviously. It's an OTC agent, but seems to work well in, in some populations. Um, the problem with difenhydramine is that 
It can also produce some side effects, such as daytime sedation, uh, GI upset, headache, nausea. And long-term studies have shown that in elderly, it can produce cognitive distortions and difficulty functioning during the day. There's some other studies looking at, anti, looking at long-term treatment with um, agents that have anticholinergic potential, showing that those agents also can produce central nervous system uh, structural changes. And even though diphenhydramine is an antihistamine, it also has anticholinergic properties. And that's one of the worrisome things about chronic use of diphenhydramine. Now, these are, this is the second group of agents, which are the ones that um, have insufficient evidence for hypnotic efficacy. There really is no evidence, uh, scientific evidence, or insufficient evidence. Chamomile, lemon balm, St. John's wort, niacin, magnesium, B12. Many of my patients come in using these, uh, not just one of them, but many, many of them, uh, and then seem to feel that they may be helpful. But again, there's simply no evidence backing up the use of these compounds as far as we can tell. The third category are the ones that not only have no evidence of hypnotic efficacy, but also raise some concerns regarding side effects and toxicity. Things like skullcap, wild lettuce, maybe a hallucinogen. Uh, skullcap may be, uh, may, be, um, uh, may be associated with seizures. Uh, uh, we, we all know about the, uh, 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 we all know about some of the issues of 5-HTP. L-tryptophan itself was associated with problems many years ago, which may not be the drug itself, but some of the uh, other compounds which were used with the drug. Be that as it may, it's now available only in prescription form. And finally, Cava-Cava, which has been uh, taken off the um, shelves of many, many countries because of the possibility of hepatotoxicity. Finally, melatonin. Melatonin is a neurohormone, and many of our patients use them. There was a meta-analysis of 20 or 19 placebo-controlled studies of more than 1,600 patients, showing that it has some possible effects which are quite modest, much more modest than CBT, as you can see. Reduction in sleep latency by about seven minutes. Total sleep time increased by about eight minutes. And there's a modest improvement in sleep quality. The problem with melatonin is that its effects are unpredictable and so modest that many patients simply don't retrieve the kind of benefit, predictable benefit, that we'd like to see. The other issues that have been raised with melatonin include those of uh, possible negative effects or side effects. This was a study, uh, for example, showing that melatonin administration, acute administration, resulted in an increase in blood glucose levels in the morning. And also, at the same time, there was no change in insulin levels. That is, insulin levels remained the same, but blood, blood glucose levels increased in the morning. In the afternoon or evening, glucose levels remained high, but insulin levels also were heightened. So what this means is that, the, that, that melatonin resulted in an increase in blood sugar levels, which insulin was not able to compensate for. So there was an insulin resistance that built up as the evening approached. Uh, the, the, the thing to remember is that many of our body organs have melatonin receptors. Uh, melatonin is an, is an important signaling system in animals uh, for the brain to signal the rest of the body about changes in the photo period or the changes in day's length, changes in the season that are upcoming. So the animal's uh, physiology and biology can change in anticipation of the oncoming seasons. So the res there, there's a plethora of melatonin receptors throughout the body. And by ingesting melatonin, even though we may be producing sleep in some cases, uh, also results potentially in an activation of a large number of peripheral receptors along multiple organ systems, raising some concerns such as this. Also concerns such as decreasing the um, uh, sensitivity of certain receptors that are needed for chemotherapeutic agents, and so on and so forth. So, uh, and, and, and other, other, other studies, by the way, suggesting that melatonin may diminish uh, fertility rates in male, uh, male rats. So be careful with melatonin. It may work. But chronic use indiscriminately, I think, is something which we should be careful about. Finally, prescription agents, they divide up into two categories. Those that the FDA has not approved as sleep, as sleep or hypnotic medications. And the second category are those that the FDA has approved as hypnotic or sleep medications. And in that category, we have the benzodiazepine receptor agonists, the melatonin receptor agonists, H1 or histamine receptor antagonists, and the orexin receptor antagonists. Let's just quickly talk about the antipsychotics and anticonvulsants. The sedating antidepressants, many of us are used to using things like trazodone at low doses, 50 milligrams, and so on. Certainly is a, is a, is a, is a, 
is a, is a viable uh, practice for many, many of our patients. The, the, some of us have, have noticed that patients do benefit, especially uh, the addition of trazodone to another antidepressant may have a, 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 an adjuvant effect. The, the issues, of course, have, have to do with side effects. Trazodone does have long-term daytime spillover effects in terms of sedation. It has anticholinergic potential, and it raises the possibility of drug-drug interactions and serotonin syndrome. So being watchful for those potential side effects would be a good idea. Finally, the antipsychotics. Many of us have also used quetiapine. Uh, as an augmentation strategy for patients with insomnia, or even as a, as a single agent for patients who have insomnia. I think that to use something like quetiapine, which has metabolic burden potential, and which has other potential side effects with somebody who has just plain old insomnia doesn't make a lot of sense. But it's certainly if the patient has a psychotic disorder, using uh, these antipsychotics uh, for sleep may not be a bad idea. Why is quetiapine used over others? Well, it's not because it has any specific effect on sleep itself. It's just the pharmacokinetics. It, it reaches Tmax very rapidly, and patients can feel the effect fairly quickly. When you look at the actual very small amounts of data available, all of the antipsychotics pretty much do the same thing when it comes to sleep, uh, but it's that rapidity of of, of uh, entry into the CNS that really defines the role of quetiapine in many of our patients. Again, off-label, not indicated for sleep, insomnia. Now, which of the following brain neurotransmitters is involved in sleep generation? Is it histamine, is it GABA, serotonin, or epi or epinephrine? Please vote. Excellent, most of you got this one right. Those of you who said histamine, it's really antihistamine, right? You, you, miss, you, you may have even forgotten the anti part. It's the antihistamine that's sleep promoting, and serotonin, not at all. And that's one of the reasons why your SSRIs produce sleep disruption. It's because activation of serotonin per se is not helpful. It's actually activation of, of the postsynaptic serotonin receptors. That's uh, the subtype of those receptors, the 5-HT2A, that may be helpful in terms of sleep. So let's go on to the understanding the role of these neurotransmitters in sleep. That will also help us understand what the hypnotics or sleeping pills do in terms of insomnia. Remember that the arousal system, the system that all of you are using right now, very, very actively, I'm hoping, is one which is involves the ascending, ascending, um, ascending neurons from the brainstem all the way to the cortex. And those neurons are mediated by four or five neurotransmitters. Those are norepinephrine, acetylcholine, dopamine, histamine, and, uh, and, uh, and serotonin. So these neurotransmitters define the wakefulness system through these ascending, uh, ascending neurons. There's a ventral tract and a dorsal tract not pictured here. Another neurotransmitter that many of you may not be familiar, familiar with is called the hypocretin neurotransmitter system. This is also called the orexin system, O-R-E-X-I-N. Orexin and hypocretin are synonymous. The, these, this, this, the primary cell bodies of this system are located in the posterior lateral hypothalamus, an area also referred to as the perifornical region. And, and it's, it, these neurotransmitters not only help wakefulness, but actually, interestingly, impinge upon all of the other neurotransmitters described here and control them in a way that promotes wakefulness in a coordinated fashion. Do you follow? So these orexin neurotransmitters seem to be very important in the mediation of wakefulness and in the maintenance of a balance between wakefulness and sleep. Now, in, 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 in existing in an equilibrium fashion with wakefulness is the sleep system. The sleep system is, is mediated primarily by GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid, and by galanin to some extent. And the, the locus of these neurotransmitters is the ventral lateral preoptic nucleus, or the VILPO. And it's the balance between these two systems that decides whether or not you're awake and asleep. And the circadian system feeds into this. The circadian system is mediated by melatonin. So this is the wake-sleep system. The ascending neurotransmitters on the one hand and the, and the sleep promoting on the, one, the other hand, that is the GABA system, which exists in, in, in balance with one another. Going to these hypocretin or orexin systems, this, this system of neurotransmitters, just for a second, which are in red here, this is a system of neurotransmitters comprised of small peptides localized in the dorsal hypothalamus, as I just mentioned, 
but are also involved in other areas, other clinical areas, potentially, uh, having to do with not only arousal, but locomotion, metabolism, blood pressure. And interestingly, some data show that they may even be involved in mood states or depression, which is very exciting, because it may be that these neurotransmitters one day may link for us the connection between sleep and depression, sleep and psychiatric disorders. But more research on coming on that. What's interesting for us here today is that the data have shown that insomniacs have, a, uh, have an elevation of these orexin levels. Remember, these activating or arousal-producing neurotransmitters. So, it, so agents or, or, or hypnotic agents or sleeping pills that may mute the orexin system may be helpful in terms of the production of sleep. Let's just go back for a second. I also wanted to mention that the, the hypnotic agents or sleeping pills that we have currently, as many of you know, primarily work on the GABA system. These are the benzodiazepines, the non-benzos, zolpidem, and so on and so forth. They're all GABA receptor agonists. And the, we'll be talking about a couple of other agents in a couple of minutes that have something to do with the orexin system that actually block wakefulness, block histamine, and block the orexin system, and thereby produce sleep, not so much by producing sleep, but more by blocking wakefulness and allowing sleep to occur. Different mechanisms. The, the conceptual aspect of this is that if you promote GABA and produce sleep by promoting, promoting GABA, fine and dandy you promote sleep, but what's the problem? Well, there are all sorts of GABA receptors throughout the cortex. GABA is the most commonly occurring uh, neurotransmitter. There are, more, there are more GABAergic receptors in the brain than any other kind of receptor. So you're promoting receptors along the lines of neuro, uh, you know, myelorelaxation, cognition, and so on and so forth, i.e. the side effect profile. So the, 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 the development of sleeping pills has, has favored a track of not so much promoting sleep through the GABAergic mechanism now, but by promoting sleep by blocking the arousal system along discrete neurotransmitter systems, histamine, orexin, and so on and so forth, with the, with the concept, with the purpose of reducing the potential for unwanted side effects. Uh, let's go on to talk a little bit about the benzos, the older benzos. You're familiar with these. Uh, estazolam, fluorazepam, quazepam, tamazepam, triazolam. Uh, excellent agents from a sleep standpoint. They promote sleep not only induction, but also maintenance in many cases. Not well studied, not studied over, the, over more than 30 days or so. So the limit, there's a limitation for the use of these agents for about 30 days, but no longer, simply based upon the fact that the, in the older days, these hypnotic trials were not performed over, over 30 days or longer. Now, now let's go on to the Z drugs and some of the newer agents. A 60-year-old man complains of insomnia. He falls asleep rapidly after going to bed, but wakes up repeatedly. Uh, starting at 1 in the morning after sleep onset, feeling fatigued the next day, what's the least appropriate medication? What's the worst medicine that you could give this man? Number one, Zolpidem extended release. Number two, Rameltion. Number three, S. Zopiclone. Number four, Doxepin low dose. Number five, Suvorexant. Please vote. So why is Zolpidem ER not the right choice? Zolpidem extended release, ER, right? This man wakes up a great deal. Your job is to make him sleep longer, right, to stay asleep. It's an excellent agent for this man. It keeps him asleep because it keeps him from waking up repeatedly. Why, uh, Roser, Rameltion, um, why is that the right answer, Rameltion? Well, Rameltion is an initiation drug. It only puts you to sleep. It doesn't keep you there. This man needs to stay asleep. So it's, it's, it's in fact, the worst drug you could give him. He's already falling asleep quickly. He doesn't need Rameltion. So the answer is B, uh, number two, of course. Esopoclone, again, a long-acting drug. That's what he needs. He wants to stay asleep. Needs to stay. Doxepin low dose. Doxepin low dose has no effect on sleep latency. It doesn't put you there, but it keeps you there. It's the ideal agent for this man. Uh, and suvorexant, again, suvorexant both puts you to sleep and has you stay asleep, again, an agent which covers bases altogether. So the right answer is Rameltion. So here are the benzodiazepine receptor agonists. Zaloplon, Sonata, Zolpidem, Ambien, Zolpidem Extended Release, Ambien, CR, S. Zolpiclone, Lunesta. All of them do the thing that this man doesn't need, which is to put, put them to sleep. If you had somebody who said, I just need to fall asleep, these are all excellent agents for that purpose. But if you need something to keep you asleep in addition, these are the only two agents that do that, Zolpidem Extended Release and S. Zolpiclone. All are Schedule Four agents. They have a slight addiction potential, and also 
Yeah, uh, there are many, multiple doses for all of these. With Zolpidem and Zolpidem extended with these for women, you have to use the lower dose, 5 and 6.25 respectively. For S. Zolpiclone, you have to start with the 1 milligram dose for both men and women and increase to 2 or 3 very carefully because there may be some daytime spillover with that drug. Now, the non-benzodiazepine agents, Remelteon, melatonin receptor agonist, it only does one thing. It just puts you to sleep. It doesn't keep you there. So if you have somebody who says, I can't fall asleep, this is an ideal agent. Doxepin, now not the doxepin that you're used to in psychiatry. This is doxepin low dose, three and six milligrams. It has zero anticholinergic potential, zero alpha adrenergic potential. It's simply an antihistamine, pure antihistamine. It mutes wakefulness. Remember, it decreases, decreases that wake drive, allowing you to fall asleep. Doxepin is a great drug in terms of sleep maintenance. And finally, suvorexant, that blocks that orexin system, that wakefulness system we talked about, and that agent is good for both sleep maintenance as well as induction. It's a Schedule IV agent. These two agents, the first two, are non-scheduled. So they're, ex they're agents which may have an advantage for patients who have drug abuse histories and, and, and other, other substance use issues. Oops, it's easy. Sorry about that. Zolpidem has introduced the, 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 uh, some variants of it, of it for specific clinical uses. The one I'd like to talk about is Zolpidem sublingual. It's an agent which is taken after patients develop insomnia in the middle of the night. So this man, whose example I mentioned, wakes up in the middle of the night at 3 in the morning. He has not taken any sleeping pills yet. He can take Zolpidem sublingual and fall back to sleep because it's such short acting, as long as he's in bed for four hours after taking it, he can then wake up and, and be refreshed in the morning. Interesting agent, it's nice to take for, it's nice for people who don't want to take a medicine at all, unless they have to. And when do you know that you have to? Well, when it's too late for every other sleeping pill. But with Zolpidem sublingual, you can take it after you wake up. Uh, and there's an oral spray version which uh, gets into the system more rapidly than Zolpidem. It's T-Max occurs much more rapidly. So patients who say, I lie in bed but I can't fall asleep, for them, the spray can put them to sleep much more rapidly because it bypasses that enterohepatic circulation. There are many uh, side effects for the sleeping pills. I'm not going to go over all of them. I'm just going to ask you to review them. One thing I do want to mention is that many of these sleeping pills have been tested uh, are being now tested in something called an SDLP, or driving sim not a driving simulator, but an actual car. So patients who, who patient, not patients, but normal subjects, take these sleeping pills, then are asked to drive a car, while thankfully another driver is next to them. So what they look at is something called the SDLP, or standard deviation of lateral position. Notice that this person here is taking a placebo, so there's very little weave, what, but this individual has, has taken a sedating drug, and there's a high level of weaving. I mean, you know this, right? If you've had too much to drink, you can't drive very well. You kind of weave, and that's what's happening. Well, above a certain threshold of 2.5 centimeters, that's considered to be too dangerous um, an amount of weaving. This was done with the low-dose, I'm sorry, the, the uh, middle-of-the-night Zolpidem, called Intermezzo. And as you can see, four hours after taking this drug, it's supposed to wear off, but a small number of patients still have enough of the drug in the system to make them have an impairment. And that's also the case after three hours of taking the drug. So the, the folks who were trying to market this drug examined this carefully and found that this was limited to a certain number of people who had a lower ability to metabolize zolpidem. And this occurred, interestingly, mainly in women. About 20% of women cannot metabolize zolpidem fast enough. And for, the women, for women, therefore, it's important to use the lower doses of zolpidem. So this is called the SDLP, or Standard Deviation Lateral Position Test, for these sleeping pills. The other concern that's raised with sleeping pills is that of parasomnias or amnestic behavior. The risk of parasomnias during hypnotic use is enhanced by which of the following factors? Number one, co-administration with other sedating drugs. Number two, major depression. Number three, younger age. Number four, female gender. And number five, lower socioeconomic status. Which one promotes the development of parasomnias during sleeping pill use? Please go ahead and vote. All right, excellent. You all got this one correct. Female gender, no. I, that was a, you, you were thrown off by what I just said. Uh, not, the, not parasomnias, no. The female gender increases the risk of the drug being on board during the course of the day, but does not increase the risk of parasomnias. So exactly. So one thing you have to advise patients to take Zolpidem in particular, do not drink alcohol, 
do not take other sedating compounds. Make sure you take it as directed. Uh, and, and these are some of the other risk factors with zolpidem-induced parasomnias. Uh, certainly if a person has a history of a parasomnia, they have sleepwalking as a child, they had sleepwalking as an adult, please do not give them these hypnotics unless you're very, very careful about that, especially zolpidem. Uh, the, uh, so these are some factors which may guide you in terms of which sleeping pill to choose. If you have a person who did, just needs to fall asleep quickly, these are the three agents of choice. If you have a person who needs to maintain sleep, that is they need to stay asleep because they wake up too much at night, these are the three choices. If you have a person who needs both initiation and maintenance, these are the proper choices. These I didn't discuss very much, but these two drugs, Romeltion and Suvorexant, have been shown to be potentially p safe in patients who have mild to moderate COPD and sleep apnea. So we use them a lot in sleep disorders because of our CPAP units fall off sometimes and patients' apnea is unprotected, so these agents may be somewhat safe for them. Abuse potential is lowest for Romeltion and Doxepin, and of course there's a patient preference could be a factor as well. A couple of thoughts about major depression. As I mentioned before, it's a common complaint insomnia that is in major depression. The challenge has always been, what do you do first? Do you treat the depression? Do you treat the insomnia? Do you treat both? There have been four double-blind placebo-controlled studies with four different agents to look at this practice. In this particular uh, study, Zolpidem alone, 10 milligrams, was used after the SSRI was introduced, after the SSRI achieved remission, and after patients had had some degree of insomnia, a resolution of their depression. And in this particular case, there was some improvement in sleepiness, but none of the depression scores improved at all. In the second study, Zolpidem extended release was introduced at the get-go with citalopram or placebo. So from the get-go, patients either took zolpidem and citalopram or zolpidem or placebo. There was, of course, improvement in sleep measures and daytime functioning, but depression scores were unaffected. In this particular study, S. Zolpiclone, Lunesta, was again introduced from the get-go with fluoxetine. Uh, uh, or with placebo. So in the, from the very get-go, patients got either fluoxetine and Lunesta or fluoxetine uh, and placebo. Interesting, the folks who got Lunesta from the very beginning, or esopoclone, had no, not only improvement in sleep, but had an overall improvement in major depression remission rates. So they, they affect, the depression scores were also positively affected, which makes us think again that it's possible that paying attention to sleep from the very beginning and doing something about it may be helpful for the depressed patient. It may, it's, not, it's not approved as an augmentation strategy, but it, it I think says to us that sleep itself may be an important uh, target variable for patients who have depression. And finally, there's a study now ongoing with Suvorexin, that, uh, that orexin receptor antagonist, for the same purpose, and there are no data yet to report on that particular study. Finally, there are a few drugs that are being developed for insomnia. They're, they're, they're on this board, they're on this slide, rather. From the standpoint of melatonin, uh, the, the number of melatonin agonists, beta blockers, histamine receptor antagonists to block wakefulness, adenosine receptor agonists. Remember, adenosine is one of the important neurotransmitters for sleep. Cannabinoid agonists. I can't tell you how many of my patients say, who have insomnia say, I tried, cannab I tried cannabinoids, I tried pot, I tried this and I tried that. And they all say it did work or didn't work. There are no data on this of any, of any sort that we can use to counsel patients, unfortunately. And uh, finally, I want to talk about uh, Lemborexant, which is the agent that's probably going to be introduced to the mar in the market the, uh, the, uh, sooner than any of, the other, of these other agents. It's a dual, uh, 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 it's a dual orexin receptor antagonist. Lemborexant is thought to regulate sleep and wake by damping wakefulness. Remember that orexin system; it is involved in dampening it. And uh, the, in the in the control studies so far, it's been shown to improve sleep latency and continuity. The pharmaceutical company that's involved in marketing it, or will, will be involved in marketing it, applied for a new drug application. So the FDA has, is reviewing the drug. We have no idea when it's going to be out or whether it's going to be out. But there have been a couple of different placebo-controlled studies, and the data at this point, unfortunately, are not in the public domain and are not in the, in the peer refereed literature. So we're looking forward to this drug. An interesting thing I wanted to mention about this that, 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 that may be of interest clinically for us when the drug is introduced. Uh, this was a study in which, again, the, 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 the driving test was used for lemborexant at various doses, 2.5, 5, and 10 milligrams. You can see that the number of patients who have had, 
who are above this dangerousness line in terms of too much weaving are very, very few, regardless of the dose of the drug given. Um, and this is kind of an interesting finding, not only at day two, but also at day nine of administration of this drug. Another interesting finding was that they actually gave these patients the drug and they woke them up in the middle of the night and administered a test called the body sway test to see if they were, they were swaying back and forth. And there's a way to assess the amount of sway. Um, and interestingly, they, they looked at zolpidem, which we were all familiar with, lumborexant as well. And with zolpidem, the amount of body sway was considerably higher than the lumborexant doses, which makes us wonder, is it possible again that because of the fact that these new drugs are targeting those wakefulness neurotransmitters, they're diminishing wakefulness along very specific lines. Is it possible that that is resulting in a sparing of some of the other areas that the GABA receptor agonists may, they may be acting upon, which they may not be desirable, among which are motor and coordination, body sway, cognition, and so on and so forth. So this is an interesting part about these new medications, and we'll see, uh, we'll see how this, this drug and others do in our, in our hands in the clinical environment. In the future, of course, the major trends for drug development include not only fewer side effects, but newer mechanisms. Uh, and this is the most exciting thing. Can we select a hypnotic clinically based on its receptor profile? Can you, for example, say that this drug acts on this particular neurotransmitter system, therefore I will be choosing this drug for this category of patients? That's going to be the most exciting uh, thing, I think, in the future to also be able to develop genetic profiles of insomniacs which may predict the benefit of certain drugs versus others. And finally, devices. There are many devices that are being introduced. The one that's exciting to me is the one that's actually a, a, a helmet that cools the head. And it's been shown to improve sleep in a number of cases. This, drug, this, this device is actually available on the market, but devices which also uh, fit on the wrist uh, are now being developed to not only monitor sleep, but also to be able to be therapeutically to affect sleep in a positive direction through the introduction of various uh, waveforms. So the area of insomnia treatment is, is potentially exciting. Uh, for the future, much more to come. When these will be in our hands at this point, I have no idea. So insomnia is prevalent in psychiatric patients. It's associated with a number of impairments. Its management begins with a systematic evaluation and treatment of the comorbidity first, I think. And finally, whenever possible, insomnia can be treated by combination strategies of both cognitive behavioral therapy as well as pharmacotherapy. And uh, that's it. All right. Thank you. Good. Let me, uh, let me catch a couple questions real quick. Um, so real quick, we've got a couple minutes. For severe treatment refractory insomnia, which of the drugs discussed are you likely to combine? Um, that, that, can, that question cannot be answered with more specific data. Yeah, there are no data on combination drugs for refractory insomnia. Okay. But whoever uh, asked that question, see me in the back and we can talk about your specific And case. which med would you recommend for chronic usage? So, you know, people that are just, that's it. They've got insomnia all their life and they're going to take something or they're going to... You know. Any of them. There's no, there are no data that, that chronic insomnia, lifelong insomnia responds any better or worse than any of the drugs that we have. Yeah. Okay. And what's your clinical opinion about a patient being on a PRN sleep aid like Ambien, limited amount for greater than a year? Typically, patients are very resistant to discontinuing, quote, because it works. Yeah, data have shown that year-long uh, treatment within any of these, well, with these Ambien, Ambien CR, um, S. Zopaclone and uh, uh, I, believe, I believe Sonata, but I'm not sure, in a, in a placebo-controlled fashion. Uh, there's no risk, really, as long as the side, side effects don't develop in the few, first few weeks. There's minimal risk of tolerance or additional side effects. Some patients need lifelong or long-term ambient or, or long-term sleeping pills. Of course, I would try to discontinue or diminish the dose every few months or every few weeks. But some patients have primary long-term refractory insomnia that simply need long-term treatment. And the data are very, very positive in this regard that show that they, they do work and have minimal side effects. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.